Often in wrestling, the run of a great star is relatively short in length. Of course, there can be a lot of reasons for this, such as in the case of Magnum TA and Stone Cold Steve Austin, when injuries cut their time in the ring short, or in the case of Batista or The Rock, each of whom left the squared circle in order to move on to Hollywood. But what about the flip side of this? What about the performers who had the longest careers in wrestling history? Well, that's exactly what we're going to be looking at today. And where better to start than with The Undertaker? Yes, if you're a wrestling fan of a certain generation, then The Undertaker was always an eternal figure for you. After all, he managed to maintain his presence in WWE through so many eras that he's the only one who can technically serve as a through line from Hulk Hogan to Roman Reigns. How did he manage to last so long? We're not entirely sure, because even as far back as the early 2000s, there were rumors of his body breaking down on him. And that was a point where he hadn't even reached his in-ring prime yet. No, while his initial run during the golden, new generation and attitude eras saw him get by on the greatness of his character, it was arguably his later ruthless aggression and PG era runs which saw him really hit his stride by being a really good wrestler too. And it wasn't like this latter part of his career would be a short-lived one either, as all the way up until 2020, the dead man was still having matches inside of a WWE ring. Sure, by that point he'd long since moved into a part-time role, but he was still very active whenever he did show up. In fact, he was more than just active, he was better than most of his younger peers. Just look at the work he put out against the likes of Shawn Michaels, Triple H, and Edge if you don't believe us. Really then, that might be the secret of his longevity, as in many ways, he has had two full careers stacked on top of one another, one where it was all about the gimmick, and one where it was more so about the matches themselves. But The Undertaker isn't the only gothic character of his era who had a very lengthy run inside of the ring, as the same could be said for the man who served as his mirror over in WCW. That's right, it's time for us to talk about Sting! And when it comes to Sting, he had an even longer career than the Phenom, as while Mark Calloway got his start in 1987 and lasted all the way till 2020, Steve Borden started two years earlier in 1985 and went on for four more years up until 2024. Really then, it should come as little surprise that during that time he'd pass through the doors of pretty much every major company out there, whether that be Jim Crockett, WCW, TNA, WWE, or AEW. Sure, he might have only spent a cup of coffee in the Fed, but his run there did have at least one notable moment in his WrestleMania showdown with Triple H. And when it came to the other promotions, he had plenty of memorable scenes play out with them too, such as his multiple world title wins or his era-defining feud with Hulk Hogan. And let's not forget the fact that the California native was able to do what almost no one who makes it to such a late stage does by going out on a high in one of the best send-offs in recent memory at AEW's 2024 Revolution pay-per-view. But not every legend who got their start back during the territory days and who currently works for AEW is ready to hang up their boots quite yet, because despite going strong for almost four decades now, Dustin Rhodes is still wrestling to this day. That's right, after all these years, it's staggering to consider that the Texas native is still able to put on such strong matches when you realize that he's currently 55 years old. But he certainly is, and while he only wrestles occasionally now, the grandson of a plumber almost always pulls out a good match whenever he does hit the ring. Of course, that's not to say he wasn't great during his earlier years either. No, there's a reason he got the moniker of The Natural, and it's not because he was good at baseball. Rather, it's because from his early days in championship wrestling from Florida and WCW, all the way through to his runs in WWE and TNA, Dustin was always one of the smoothest and most underrated workers out there. Someone you could put up against anyone and feel confident that he was going to do his job properly with them. That's the reason he always seemed to find himself with a job no matter how much his addiction issues got out of control. And it's the same reason why later and into his career, he'd be in such high demand as a trainer. Sure, he might never have been as big of a star as his father Dusty, and he might never have been a world champion like his brother Cody, but for longevity, if nothing else, he remains as many fans' favorite member of the entire Rhodes family nonetheless. After all, who else could have gotten so much out of the Gold Dust gimmick back in the 90s? And who else could have had probably his best match ever in his 50s when, while 50 years old, he took on the American Nightmare in an absolute five-star classic at AEW's inaugural pay-per-view event, Double or Nothing, in 2019. But Dustin Rhodes isn't the only legend with a lengthy career who's aged like fine wine, as the same could be said about our next current-day AEW alumni, Chris Jericho. That's right, Jericho has always been capable of tapping into his creative side to keep his character fresh. 
In fact, it's this skill which has seen him last in the industry for so long at such a high level. It doesn't matter if it's his early days working in Mexico as the Lionheart, his breakthrough run in WCW, his many different incarnations in WWE, or his most recent period spent being All Elite, Chris Jericho has always been a major part of the conversation and has almost always been somewhere near the top of the card. But then maybe this could be put down to the sheer volume of different versions of himself he's come up with over the years, as whenever one runs its course, there's always something different to take its place and make him feel fresh all over again. Tired of Y2J? No problem, because the Winnipeg native had a suit and tie clad heel ready in his back pocket to replace it with. And when that was over, he came up with other great gimmicks, such as the List and the Painmaker. Hell, even as recently as the autumn of 2022, his series of bouts with John Moxley and Brian Danielson were fantastic. But then that's just a testament to the amount of skill and experience the Ayatollah of Rock and Rolla has under his belt. Skill and experience he's collected over the course of three and a half decades. Does this make his lengthy career better than our next subjects, though? Well, that's hard to say. Who are we talking about here? Why, Rey Mysterio, of course. That's right. Well, it might be hard to tell given the fact that his face is hidden under a mask and stem cell therapy has given him the knees of a 20-year-old, Ray is actually 49. And that means, as a result of him getting his start in the ring in 1989, he's been doing this since he was 14. Yes, the father of Dirty Dom certainly earned the right to step in the ring while he was still in his mid-teens, as even back then, he was showing himself to be a complete prodigy. Of course, that meant by the time he made it to places like AAA and ECW during the mid-90s, he was already a phenomenon and one of the most talented in-ring performers of his generation. Someone so good, he'd become one of those few luchadors who truly broke out into the English-speaking world in a major way after joining WCW in 1996. And while this would have been a high peak for most, things would only get better for Ray from there, as following his time in Atlanta, he'd move over to WWE, where he'd spend the next couple of decades achieving such major goals as winning multiple world titles and coming out the victor in the 2005 Royal Rumble. Hell, even after he'd left the Fed for a while starting in 2015, he'd prove he still had it despite his advancing age, with this being the period he returned to his Lucha roots in AAA, all while working for the likes of Lucha Underground, Japan, and appearing at the first All In. Then of course, once that was over and he went back to WWE, he'd use his new knees for all they were worth by once more establishing himself as a player there, though this time his role was mainly to help get the next generation over, more specifically, his son. And it was also during this latter run that he got to reunite with an old friend, someone who's had a very lengthy career of their own. Yes, we couldn't do this video without at some point talking about Randy Orton. What's made Randy Orton such an evergreen presence in WWE over the years? Well, he's got the pedigree, what with him being a third generation wrestler and all. And he's also got the talent, because just like Dustin Rhodes, he's one of the smoothest performers out there. And especially in the latter half of his career, he's been able to put on great in-ring performances, work which has allowed him to remain in or around the main event scene even after being in the ring for over 20 years. In fact, so durable has he been that of the famed OVW class of 2002, he's the only one who's still wrestling full-time. With Shelton Benjamin and Brock Lesnar both being part-time now, Dave Bautista retired, and John Cena all but retired. And despite being 44, it doesn't seem like the Viper is going to be hanging up his boots anytime soon. No, even what at one point seemed like a potentially career-ending back injury he recently sustained couldn't put him down forever. Honestly, of all the people we're looking at today, Randy may have the best chance of being a world champion again before his time is done, possibly even as recently as this year, if WWE are looking for a heel to eventually dethrone Cody Rhodes. But even if he never wins the gold again, his legacy as one of the longest serving and best wrestlers out there will be secured regardless. And it'll be secure because he's proven time and time again just how good he is and just how well he can hold up to the ravages of time. Unfortunately though, wrestlers can't keep competing forever, something our next subject has had to deal with. Having said this though, it doesn't mean Ric Flair didn't have a lengthy in-ring career which can proudly stand up against anyone else's in the history of the business. Yes, you could make a very solid argument that of all the great in-ring talents the wrestling world has produced over the years, names like Bret Hart, Kurt Angle, and Brian Danielson, Ric Flair is the best of them all. After all, there's a reason people like Steve Austin and Triple H consider him to be the GOAT. In fact, he was always this good, even in his early days during the 70s. 
And that's why after his first decade of working for places such as Vern Gagne's American Wrestling Association and Jim Crockett Promotions, the National Wrestling Alliance would bestow their ultimate honor on him when they made him their world's champion for the first time in 1981. That said, while for most performers this would have been the peak of their career, for the nature boy it was just the beginning, as over the next two decades he'd become world champion at least 15 more times. And even once his time being top dog came to an end, he'd still have a few years left in him, because upon jumping back over to WWE to start his second run there in late 2001, he'd have another seven years worth of matches, all before being retired by Shawn Michaels at WrestleMania 24. Of course, as with all wrestler retirements though, this one wouldn't last forever, and so, after joining TNA, Rick would continue to wrestle for a few more years yet. And who knows, we might still get another in-ring run from the Nature Boy before all is said and done. Maybe he'll just continue having matches forever, in fact, the same way our next subject is operated, none other than Jerry Lawler. That's right, while he doesn't wrestle on television anymore, even at 74 years old, the King still hits the ring from time to time in the Memphis territorial promotion he maintains ownership of. And that means as of 2024, his career has lasted for a full 54 years. But while for modern fans the most well-known part of his career might be his time in WWE during the 90s, when his obituary is eventually written, it won't be that run which is talked about first. Rather, it'll be his time as the top dog of the Continental Wrestling Association, the very place where throughout the 70s and 80s, he was nothing less than a god. Why was he so highly regarded there? Well, because he was so over as a babyface, even modern-day Cody Rhodes would look at him and realize he needed to up his game in order to compete. And it wasn't just the adoration of fans which made Lawler a legend in Memphis either. No, it was also the regional top titles he won, with him actually holding the NWA Southern Heavyweight Championship a staggering 58 times before all was said and done. Then of course, there was his legendary program with iconic comedian Andy Kaufman, something which gained a huge amount of nationwide notoriety once the two appeared to get into a shoot fight on an episode of Late Night with David Letterman. And after that, there was his superb empty arena brawl with someone else we'll get to in a moment. Yes, years before he even considered moving over to WWF, the King was already living up to his moniker. And while most of his time spent in the Fed would see him play the role of color commentator, like we mentioned a moment ago, that doesn't mean he wasn't still wrestling elsewhere, with his last match to date being in August of 2021. Will there be more to come from him in the future? Possibly. And that means once all is said and done, he might have the longest in-ring career of anyone. That said, even Jerry Lawler might argue his run wasn't quite as storied as our next subject, the late great Terry Funk. That's right, Terry Funk is a man who could do it all. Promos, great matches, as well as hardcore brawling, and on top of this, he even managed to get over strongly as both a great heel and a babyface. That's right, the Funkster was awesome in every sense of the word, and a big part of the reason for that was his versatility. Versatility which first really showed itself when, upon getting his start in 1965 and spending the initial few decades of his career working the territories as a skilled in-ring technician and one-time NWA World's Champion, he'd morph into an entirely different performer as middle age fell upon him. Why did he change things up so much at this point? Well, like all the greats, the Amarillo native realized he needed to adapt to the times, and in the 90s, the times were very much about extreme violence, the type you'd find in Paul Heyman's renegade ECW promotion. So that was why he completely reinvented himself there as a middle-aged and crazy brawler, someone who would do anything at any time if it meant getting the victory, with this being a far cry from the man who had previously gone toe-to-toe -to -toe in technical encounters against opponents such as Jack Briscoe, Dusty Rhodes, Ric Flair, and Giant Baba. And so much of a success was this hardcore character, it would even stick with him after he left ECW and went to places like IWA Japan or WWF. Unfortunately though, come the time the late 2010s rolled around, the Funkster would truly have to retire from the ring for good as he would battle illness before tragically passing away in 2023 at the age of 79. Of course, this was a tragedy and was a sad way for things to end, but that doesn't change the fact that while he was there, Terry was one of the all-time greats, something which is evident in just how long he lasted for. But it's not all the men who had lengthy careers in the ring, because the exact same thing could be said about our next subject too, Mae Young. And with Mae Young, this is doubly impressive as to be a woman in the industry back then was a much tougher thing to do. So, because of that, many of the girls didn't have the same staying power. That said, the Oklahoma native wasn't any normal woman. Rather, she was something of a phenomenon. 
And that's exactly why, after she got her start in 1939 while she was still in high school, she continued on for almost a century. Seriously, while she might only have been active as a part-time performer post-1970s, Young would continue to hit the ring from time to time, all the way up until November of 2010 at which point she was 80 years old. And because of the success she had during this second phase, it's not as if her early years when she was at her physical peak are even the most famous part of her run now. No, it's actually her time working for WWF during the Attitude Era she's probably most fondly remembered for today, the time when, despite already being a senior citizen, she was only too happy to take some absolutely crazy bumps on a semi-regular basis. Of course, we'd be remiss if we didn't pay some focus to those early decades, though, as this was when, during a time period where women's wrestling truly was a sideshow, she came across as someone who was completely legitimate and worthy of stepping into the same ring as the boys. In fact, that's why over the course of this first run, she'd become a two-time women's world champion and one-time women's tag team champion. Really then, if it wasn't for her, you might not have performers like Charlotte Flair or Rhea Ripley today, as with the work she was doing in legitimizing her craft decades before it ever got taken seriously by the US big leagues, she's nothing less than a pioneer. But the same label could also be applied to our next subject too, because while he wasn't laying the groundwork for other women, his hardcore brawling helped to define a style which continues to be hugely popular today. Who are we talking about this time? Who else but Abdullah the Butcher. Now, if you were a wrestling fan in the 60s, 70s, 80s, or even the early 90s, then three of the most terrifying words you could hear were Abdullah the Butcher. And that's because there was such a mythology surrounding his character, such an air of danger, that it was easy to feel like even if the rest of this stuff was fake, he was the real deal. After all, those scars on his head couldn't be faked, and his constant attacking open of his opponent's heads with a fork mid-match was most certainly legitimate. So it's understandable fans would regularly feel the desire to flee for their lives whenever he showed up. Was he always this crazy though? Well, yes because way back when he got his start in 1958 at the age of 17, Abby was already developing the character of an absolutely sadistic madman, and this character would only grow more wild as time went on, with it getting to a point that it was guaranteed the ring would be a blood-soaked mess every time one of his bouts ended. Obviously then, this means he never got a run in WWF during the 80s, as back then they were in the midst of their child-friendly golden era. But that didn't stop the Orlando native from going to just about every other territory under the sun, and there absolutely dominating the scene, with this being something he did all the way up until his ultimate retirement in October of 2010. Yes, for over half a century, Abdullah was an evergreen presence in the wrestling industry someone whose love of violence could only be touched by the likes of Mick Foley and a few others. But then, as we've seen today, he isn't the only evergreen presence out there, as everyone we've looked at in this video can say the exact same thing about themselves.